women. There are uh, a lot of people in this room that are uh, more competent at sailing than me, hard to believe, and uh, may even have a little bit more experience. But what I'm here to do is tell you everything they're going to tell you is a bunch of BS, and all you need to do is get out there. I didn't know how to sail properly, or have things in mind like safety, or may even have more beer on the boat than uh, life-saving equipment. <laughs> But I still got out there, and my, my story here is to tell you guys what, what it's like to get out there and, and just go for it. Uh, I'm going to start off, and I'm just going to cover off some of the, the, the items that I found daunting. Much like Ben, one of the biggest challenges for me was the paperwork. When you get out there and you see that you have to provide insurance certificates, uh, <laughs> crew lists, and... Uh, of course, the PIYA certification, it can appear quite daunting. And I think a lot of people hit that and then they get confused, a little, a little worried, and they don't really know where to go. Now, all this stuff is going to be covered off in greater detail with the, the uh, subsequent speakers, but what I want to tell you is that it's actually not that big of a deal. Short of having a Bayliner Buccaneer 27 or a McGregor 26, your boat probably meets all the hull stability requirements, all of the uh, uh, you know cockpit drainage requirements, and this kind of stuff that you'll read in this document. They'll appear very very confusing, and you'll wonder if you have to get like 200 liters of water, dump it in your cockpit, and watch drainage rates. You don't need to do any of this kind of stuff. You basically take a look, see if a boat like yours has ever sailed it before, and if it's any kind of moderate production boat built after probably the late 1960s, you're probably okay. Probably. So, sorry? Probably. 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 The McGregor's need not apply. Hey, the 25 probably could make it. The, the 60 feet. 65 feet. Or the 60. So, basically, I mean, all you need to do this race is a PHRF certificate or, or IRC. Uh, yeah. uh, I can't even think like that, that's way too fast for me. Yeah. Uh, you need your PHRF certificate from PHRF BC or PHRF Northwest. So that's quite an easy document to get. If you have any questions, there's a lot of people here that can help you with that. Uh, in terms of crew list, it's common sense, you just provide their name, phone number. We're not dealing with anything complicated here. Insurance certificate, you do have to carry, what is it, $2 million liability? $2 million in liability. Uh, if you have any kind of standardized marine uh, insurance policy through Dolphin, TOS, or that type of thing, you're already covered. Oh, All you need is <coughs> title, Navis. title sponsor. Oh, and Navis. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> you're good. You just need a letter. You need to scan it and email it into the, the guys at the at Straits, or you can even walk it in for a little old school. When it comes to PIYA, this is where I actually, when I was doing my first uh, straights back in 2009, I actually got uh, the most intimidated. I saw this document with, you know, two, three pages. I heard there's going to be safety inspection at the end, and that I had to meet, uh, you know, to the letter all these items. And you do. You really do. You, you need to meet the safety requirements. It's not up for debate. And uh, yes, there's a good chance that there's a 10-year-old kid who's going to ask you three questions when you hit that dock, but you want to make sure that you can answer those, uh, those, those three questions correctly. Now, what I did is, you can go through that whole document, and uh, we don't have time for that today. If you have questions at the end, we can, we can work our way through it. And it's so actually in that handout, sorry, it's actually yeah. in the back of the handout, the PIOA checklist, which is a safety checklist. Cap so take a look at that. If you're a new skipper and you're trying to prep your boat frantically and, and get it ready to go, take a look through that and then ask any questions you have at the end, because we've probably been through it. And I've more recently been through it than, than some of the people, <coughs> Carrie Donis, uh, who started doing this back uh, you know, before I was born. Uh, I think there's some items, though, that people uh, get hung up on uh, in particular, and I found difficult to uh, back up steering devices. Um, I have a, a stern-hung rudder. Uh, the chance of that thing really falling off are probably not all that great or I've got bigger problems. Uh, the idea that you have to have another rudder, that's great if you do. Do you want to be one of those guys that picks up a Cal 20 rudder and uh, put some extra gudgeons, and on, or gudgeons on the back and hang it there? That's awesome. But you can get by with a lot of other devices. A lot of people out there are using things like spinnaker poles with a piece of plywood, some U-bolts, and making that work. Uh, other people are using 
literally oars attached to lace fan doors, that type of thing. Uh, don't overthink it too much. Uh, just ask around, see what other people have done. That's one of the things that I found daunting because I, I had all these images of trying to fabricate something out of fiberglass and uh, rigging up uh, extra things on the back of the boat. Ultimately, it's up to the skipper to decide what you know what's going to work for you, your boat, your crew. Right? You just have to be able to demonstrate that it's uh, somewhat functional. And let's be honest: anything that we uh, jury rig in the uh, at 3 a.m. in the middle of the rain is basically just going to allow you to do a controlled run downwind, uh, hopefully to someplace safe. Back up the HF antenna. If you got a handheld and a and a fixed mount, you're good to go. If you just have a fixed mount, uh, you can pick up uh, backup antennas. Uh, these things run about 60 bucks at West Green. That's not a big deal. Um, I run, I have all three on the boat, so uh, it's something. You know, if you want to get this kind of stuff, the last thing you want to be doing is doing this like two weeks before and you're walking down to West Green and guess what? They don't have any in stock. I like to wait till like the night before. Night before, <laughs> yeah. Call Ty yeah. crying. I can't do it. Or a discount. Well, that's when you get the bolt cutters and start walking the docks to the beer senior. Next step for the VHF. The other thing I think I found a little weird was the backup lighting. Again, this is something that can be bought at uh, at West Marine. You don't have to worry about this, guys. It's uh, it's pretty straightforward to come with. You just want to make sure it has two mile range. Uh, it comes like a flashlight. You, I duct tape that thing on there so many times when I've uh, lost my light when tacking too close to somebody and. Uh, <laughs> Happened twice. Rubbin's racing. Rubbin's yeah. racing. <laughs> Very good. These, these kind of things are, are the things that shouldn't hold you back. These are just little items. Just do your research, ask around, and you'll find the right, right solution. When it comes to the safety gear that I really take the most seriously, I probably look at the, the personal safety gear. And again, you want to make sure you follow this to the T because it's the individual people. That's the thing they're going to ask most likely. You want to make sure that you have your PDFs, your lights, uh, and, and, and your PFDs uh, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. PDFs. Well, Adobe's a big. Yes. Adobe's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, very supportive. We just like to plug Adobe yeah. whenever we can. <laughs> your whistle. <is> <laughs> So that was the first barrier. The next barrier was actually the psychological barrier of actually getting out there and doing the race. Now, I'll tell you what I did. I thought I was a pretty smart guy. I came up with a whole plan, and uh, we got out there on the water. Uh, we The first 2009 straights that I did was actually about a 25-35 knot kind of uh, evening. Started off a little light. Um, we did not adhere to any kind of uh, schedule for sleeping. I let guys kind of ad hoc determine it. Uh, I asked that everybody bring like three pairs of backup clothing, a sleeping bag, toiletries, anything they thought they'd need. Uh, we had the v berth completely round with gear. I thought I'd bring my six closest friends on a 27-foot on boat. Again, uh, now there's about three close friends. Uh, we brought a, I, I've installed a gimbal stove in the boat. I was super stoked about this. I had all these kind of like crazy offshore ideas of cooking while underway. <laughs> brought food to cook. That was a novel idea. Uh, and, and there was basically a lack of, pre, uh, of preparation for some of my more delicate members of my career that suffered from seasickness. So uh, when it was a, a nice balmy day at the beginning of the race, I allowed them to pound as much uh, rum and, uh, and coke as they wanted. And uh, didn't say, hey guys, maybe it's starting to pick up a little bit, time to pop that grab ball. Uh, we, we didn't go down that road. Uh, the result was is that I spent uh, about uh, 20 hours uh, straight, which compared to some of the people out there is not a lot, awake. Uh, the only person capable of sailing the boat. I had five people uh, exhausted, vomiting their guts out down below in eight foot seas. Get them on and bash your heads up. <laughs> we did not prep our head sail. I thought that we had six crew. We'd be able to change, do a head sail peel and, and uh, put a new head sail on and uh, reduce sail area. We weren't able to do it. We were overpowered in 30 knots with a 150 Genoa up and uh, basically no main at that point. And uh, it, was just, it, was, it was all me. <laughs> That's right. That's why when you see that last place finish, uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. So that was my last Southern, uh, that was my, sorry, my first Southern Straits. And uh, it was, to say the least, a learning curve. So, 
what I learned to do differently, and and not to put uh, too fine a point on it, is to again overthink some things and underthink others. I mean, we have way too much like extra clothing. I mean, one duffel bag split among three, or uh, you know, a few changes of clothing of split, split amongst the group. That's how we roll now. Two sleeping bags, a crew of four. You know. Uh, we also uh, really thought about things through, like, you you look at and you see someone wear, bring a pair of ski goggles and one of those, like, mountain equipment, like, bike courier masks on a boat, they put a freaking door. <laughs> I'm just going to top up and flex it out. No way. <laughs> 3 a.m. is the 3 a.m. Uh, that thing looks pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> well lead mask. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Uh, we also reduced the amount of alcohol in the boat. Uh, <laughs> and, hey, why'd you quit Ooh. last year? We ran out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it, was little, it was a little late last year. It was a little late. A little late. I got CS27, man. That like 20 knots before he starts moving. Uh, the other thing, too, is we didn't follow a crew schedule religiously last time. This time, uh, since then, I've become Captain Ahab. It's like you get down there right fucking now. Like two hours. You're down there. I don't care if it's 4 p.m. Get down there. And they go down and they climb into their bunk and they do that. Following that schedule was the biggest, honestly, it was the, the biggest game changer for us because we actually have rest, rest of the crew when things started going sideways. The other thing, we obviously made sure that our more delicate members of our crew stayed on top of their, their health. They had their uh, seasickness medication if they had it. I don't know if any of you guys suffer from uh, or any of you guys have crew that suffer from this. Uh, it's an odd mix having people that vomit their guts out every 10 seconds and then still come out and keep doing it, but oddly I found these people. <laughs> I want to say, just think it's a diving tactic. <laughs> that was a big deal for us. The other thing, uh, too, is that you really do have to think things through. You can't get lazy. Uh, that was the big thing for me. We did not have our, head, our change of head sails. Uh, now I have my... Uh, my small storm sail, or what I call storm sail, is probably about a 90%. Lash to the deck with uh, with lines yeah. run, uh, run through it, back, leading aft. Uh, we've always got our kite ready to go. Everything's always always ready to go. Rigging lines are ready to go. The, the um, reef lines, all ready to go. We just stand on top of that kind of stuff because you get lazy, uh, especially on a dead day. And then when the shit starts hitting the fan, last thing you want to be doing is having three people peeking down below and trying to figure out how to uh, drag the, the sail out of the locker and uh, you know, find the new sheets and that type of thing. So I, I guess just in closing, what I would say is that get out there and do this race. The, the people that are going to speak after me are going to go through all the, the finer elements in detail and give you the, 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 the sage advice of ages, the, the wisdom of ages. And, uh, I think he just called you old. <laughs> you are, Trevor. Thank you. <laughs> no. Yes, I'm tears up right. Yeah. And uh, just get out there. Honestly, there are a lot of people. One of the things that actually got me out the first time is that I had a group of people that I could actually talk to, ask the questions that I needed to know to get my boat out there for the first time. This is something that's very doable, and uh, it can look daunting at first, and I just encourage you to do it. You will learn a lot. It improves your seamanship 100-fold. Uh, and uh, this is the kind of thing, even if you're not a racer, you're not a round the cans kind of guy, you're the kind of person that likes it, uh, just cruising, this is the race for you because this improves your seamanship. It's not just about how fast you can whip an, an Olsen 30, forgive me, around the, the boys. It's about what kind of seaman you are. And this actually does test that and forces you to improve or learn by the consequences. Anyway. So that's why.